Welcome back to probabilistic machine learning lecture number eight. Here we are in the course. We saw that probabilistic reasoning is the extension of propositional logic to reasoning under uncertainty. Doing so can be expensive computationally because it requires keeping track of a potentially exponentially large or combinatorially large search space. We can nevertheless sometimes complete this process by separating parts of the reasoning process using conditional independence. We can also extend this notion to continuous variables and the resulting computations can then be addressed by various generic computational tools, one of them being sampling and Monte Carlo methods. In the last two lectures, we saw another way to deal with the complexity of high dimensional continuous valued inference, and that is to constrain ourselves to only use linear relationships between variables and only to use Gaussian distributions on all latent and observable quantities. This works because Gaussian distributions then map the process of inference, the abstract notion of solving or computing posteriors by integrating out latent variables onto linear algebra. And linear algebra is something that computers are good at. It's not for free, but computers are efficient at it. So that's a way to get tractable inference. In the last lecture, we saw that we can use this framework not just to learn individual variables, but to learn entire functions. Here's a one-dimensional picture again that I used on the previous lectures. So here is a hypothesis space over functions that is created by assuming that the, that the true function, which is something here in green, it can be written as a weighted sum, so as a linear map, of a bunch of features. And here I've chosen a particular set of features. These are sigmoidal features, so they are functions that start at zero and then they smoothly go to one. There's a bunch of them. If you now make observations and assume that the observations are evaluations of that function at particular points, corrupted by Gaussian noise, then we are exactly in the situation where all the quantities we care about are linearly related because the function is a linear map or the observations are, are a linear map of the underlying weights and all the probability distributions involved are Gaussians. The prior is Gaussian over the weights, therefore the prior over the function is Gaussian and the observations are linear maps of the weights corrupted by Gaussian noise and therefore the posterior distribution is a Gaussian distribution which, has, which is described by two parameters. This is what it looks like. And um, that's a bunch of somewhat complicated linear algebra down here or ex expressions. But the point is that it is linear algebra and that these computations can be performed efficiently on a computer even though they look a little bit tedious. And we saw last in the last lecture that we can implement these kind of computations efficiently using low-level operations that are available without even needing access to complicated machine learning toolboxes. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be using toolboxes, it's just interesting to know because it gives us direct access to the underlying computations. We ended the lecture last time though on a little bit of a, of a downer, which is that if you look at, at this posterior distribution, then it is not particularly satisfying. So one issue, for example, is that it doesn't fit the data quite well around here. It doesn't adapt to this shape well. And also the extrapolation abilities are maybe a bit questionable. The uncertainty here is not perfectly calibrated. And we saw that all of this basically is caused by this choice of feature functions. So it's a little bit annoying that we have to use these feature functions. What could we do to fix this? Well, one way to do this, a very pedestrian way, is to just stare at these feature functions and say, hmm, maybe, maybe if we don't put them so regularly, right? Maybe if we don't distribute them like at constant distances from each other, we can make this work a bit better. So let's look at the data and notice that this requires us looking at the data, which is problematic for two reasons. One, because in practice you can't always do it. This is a one dimensional picture and, and uh, many applied problems aren't one dimensional. They're much, much more high dimensional. 
And the second problem is a more philosophical one, that it's not particularly probation to deconstruct your prior after having looked at the data. So that kind of breaks our nice philosophical conceptual separation between prior assumptions and uh, the likelihood of the data. But let's just do it anyway. I mean, we're practically minded people, so maybe just, we just ignore the philosophical issues arising from this. We could just say, maybe I put my uh, features more like this. So what I've done here is actually I've still used a regular distribution of the features. They're just not um, regularly, well, they're just not uh, uniformly distributed anymore from minus eight to eight, but instead they are more, they are more um, densely spaced in the middle and more spaced more apart on the outside. And the way I actually did this is I took a Gaussian cumulative density function and spaced the locations of these features at regular intervals on the CDF. So that gives a kind of a cent centered, like a, a, a more density here in the middle. And that's totally arbitrary. It still keeps a little bit of structure, but it's just something you could do because it does give rise to this kind of posterior. So using the same number of features and the same kind of features and just choosing where they are differently, we get uh, in many ways a nicer distribution. So one nice thing about this is that um, this here in the middle, we now get a better, cap like we capture the structure of the data better. But there are also other nice properties, like for example, that the function returns to zero here and that it linearly extrapolates here or constantly extrapolates to the right. Of course, depending on what you know about this data set, this might be a good or a bad thing, but it's not, you know, it, for ma in many reasons, this might be argued to be a nice thing. It's a very natural thing to, ex to extend uh, in a continuous fashion over here, for example. I mean, what else are you going to do? Now, since we've already broken with our philosophical framework and we've sort of uh, fiddled around with the model having looked at the data, maybe we can keep doing that and say, well, now actually, maybe now that we've done that, we could do this even better. So notice that here I'm using about 16 features, I think. Um, that seems a little bit overkill because now we have all these features in here in regions that maybe don't that matter so much, actually. So how about I change these features a little bit more? So first of all, one thing I can do about these sigmoid features is that I can also change their gain, so I can make them a bit more steep, more like step functions, or a bit, little bit wider. And um, then I can also really think about where to put them, and then maybe I, I end up uh, realizing that I only need maybe something like four features or so. That's a reduction by uh, you know, a factor of four, basically, right? Uh, just one over here where data starts and it's relatively continuous here then anyway. Then there's this step in the middle that I just need to model with one particular feature and then maybe just a bit more flexibility for the model down here to uh, get capture the other structure in the data. If you do this, then this is what the posterior looks like. It's maybe not perfect, but it still actually uh, constantly extrapolates just a little bit further up here. We don't see it anymore. It still goes back to zero. It does have this nice little kink here in the middle. And uh, you know, that's just four degrees of freedom. I have a data set here that contains, I think, 18 data points and I've reduced it to four degrees of freedom very efficiently. And I'm still doing Bayesian inference. I'm just, you know, I'm sort of uh, thrown away a little bit the issue that I should really not look at the data when um, designing my prior. But other than that, I still get posterior distributions that have some width. That width is actually informed by the data. We could argue about whether it's particularly well chosen or not. Why don't we do this more often, right? This is maybe something we should try. It's just a little bit annoying that we have to do it by hand and it's tricky, like, tricky to do this in a practical setting if you have data that is more than just one dimensional. So what's just happened here? So what we've just done is we've, uh, let me just re re repeat this process that I just sort of did in this, um, uh, you know, hand wavy pedestrian way. So we are doing Bayesian inference on some unknown weights of our function, given the data, and to do so, we use a model. That model is given by the feature functions phi. So what we've done in the previous lecture is we've computed a posterior distribution over those weights from the data, given that we've chosen a particular model. This is, how to do this is described uniquely, correctly, by Bayes' theorem. Multiply the prior with the likelihood and divide by the evidence. Now the annoying thing is that we have to choose these feature sets phi. Not only is it annoying that we have to choose them um, because that means that we might be you know, restricted by the choice we, we make, it's also problematic that if, even if we think about trying to, make, uh, trying to choose phi, there is an infinitely large space of features, as I pointed out in the previous lecture. There's very, very little constraints on what kind of features you could consider. 
to, uh, to build these kind of models. So the first thing we just did, and I didn't actually explicitly say, explicitly say so, but I did it anyway, is I decided to use a particular family of features. So I said, I'm going to use these sigmoid features. That was a totally arbitrary decision. I just said, why not use those sigmoid features? And so these sigmoid features, by the way, they look like this. So this is a logistic function. It's the feature function number i of the data point x, of the input location x, um, given some two parameters, theta 1, theta 2, is 1 over 1 plus the exponential of minus x minus theta 1 over theta 2. So the usual way you see these functions is, is just e to the minus x, and then that's this typical sigmoid function. If x is very, very small, so if it's a large negative number, then there's a large positive number in here. e to the large positive number is a large number, so the whole thing is 1 over a large number 0, right? So this function starts at 0. If x is a very large positive number, then here we have e to the minus very large number, that's 0, and we have 1 over 1, so the function goes to 1, okay? So what I've now done here is I've introduced two parameters that shift x and scale it, theta 1 and theta 2. And by doing so, I can move these functions around from the left and the right, and I can make them steeper or more flat, flatter, by increasing or decreasing theta 2. So by moving, moving around by changing theta 1, scaling by changing theta 2. That was a specific decision that we we're going to do that. I also um, played around actually with the number of these features, i from 1 to f. And now, um, what I did actually is I hand-tuned those choices, theta 1 and theta 2, such that I somehow liked the model. So maybe we can do this a little bit more formally, and in the process of that, one thing you might notice is that, hang on, this is just two more numbers, or actually f times two more numbers, theta 1, theta 2 for each feature i, that um, we don't know. So if there's something we don't know in our model, then there is a correct way to treat, to treat it, it's just to make it part of the inference. So really, we should just add theta to the set of unknown parameters or variables or whatever you want to call them and extend our hypothesis space from putting a probability measure over w to also put one over theta. And then, shouldn't we be able to just compute the posterior distribution over w and theta? Well, actually, maybe we can. This process is called hierarchical Bayesian inference. It's hierarchical because there are these two different layers in our model. We have the, the, the weights w that previously we considered as our core unknown object, and now there's this other set of variables called theta, which actually are also part of the stuff that we don't know. So what we're doing when we're doing Bayesian inference over the weights or the function, which are essentially the same thing, right? Because they're collected, uh, connected directly by um, a linear map. Then we, um, we're computing a posterior, at least we did so so far in the, in, the, in the previous lecture, over the unknown function f, or over the unknown weights w, given the data, x and y, and the model parameters theta, by taking the prior, which depends on the um, model parameters theta, multiplying it with the likelihood, right? Because why does the prior depend on, on, on theta? Because f is phi times uh, w, and phi depends on theta. And then normalized by the evidence. And now what you might notice is that this object here in the denominator, the evidence term, that's a marginal over f, so we're integrating out the unknown function f, given theta, and we compute prior over f given theta times likelihood, um, which is a probability over y given f uh, and theta df. So what we're left with is a, is a marginal distribution for y given x and theta, where x is just the input data. So, I mean, we actually know x, so that's fine, that's not a problem. But what we have down here is essentially another likelihood term. It's just not a likelihood for f. Uh, sorry, it's not a likelihood for y given f and theta. It's a likelihood for y given just theta. So this is exactly of the same form as above here. It's just that we've gotten rid of f. So we could continue to use this process and now say, well, I just need a posterior over theta now, right? So what I, need, what I should do is I compute this object, which is 
a posterior over theta given y, which is given by a prior over theta. Okay, we don't know yet what that is, but we can, you know, set it but to whatever we like essentially and think about whether we like that prior assumption or not. Multiply it with this likelihood for y given theta, which we have up here essentially. So I've dropped x now because it doesn't really matter. We know what x is anyway. And then, well, you know, to Bayesian inference, so we have to divide by the evidence, which is the normalization contents, uh, constant, so that's the integral over, like we have to integrate out theta. Interesting. So this is a, a process we can actually often do and that we typically do in any kind of data modeling. We start by, like, we, 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 sort of, we, we, we have to deal with different types of quantities to care about. There is the data, which is stuff we get to see. So the data is in many ways actually the easiest bit, at least conceptually. I mean, in practice, it's often hard to get and to maintain and to work with. But conceptually, it's the easiest thing because it's a bunch of numbers that's just stored on your hard drive. So you know everything about the data. Then there are the quantities we actually care about, the ones we want to make statements over. These are often called variables. Then there are quantities in the model that just, like, that might affect the data just as much as the variables do, but in the end, we won't care about them. We want to get rid of them because they are not like, part of our, the, the question we're trying to answer. You might call these parameters of the model, and these are things you want to integrate out, you want to get rid of. You could also call them variables. Sometimes the distinction is a bit wake. And then there are these things like theta, which we really want to, like, we really want to, want to infer as well, ideally. Um, and sometimes we can even do so. But also, like, even if you do that, even if you are able to, to integrate out uh, f here and do pro full probabilistic inference on theta, then the next question you might have is, so maybe let's go back, right? So the next question you might have is, let's say I've, I've managed to do full Bayesian inference on those values of theta 1 and theta 2. And the next question someone might, of course, ask is, well, but why did you choose uh, sigmoidal features? Why did you choose these particular logistic functions as, their fe as your features? As we know from the last lecture, you could do, you know, uh, inference on uh, cosine functions or step functions or anything else. Why did you use but these particularly? And that, that's another parameter of our model, like which family of features we are using. So eventually, you can imagine that there is some kind of reductio ad absurdum where at some point it's just, it's impossible to keep arguing in, uh, uh, to more and more deeper detail because it just becomes completely intractable. And these kind of final layers of parameters where we at some point we say stop okay that's that's the last layer we're going to deal with and um, we, we're just going to set these parameters in some way and we're not going to put compute posteriors over them anymore these are often called hyperparameters and of course what exactly is a hyperparameter and a parameter and a variable is debatable um, in any particular practical setting and it's also not particularly important it's just uh, a, a way to think about what you are going to do computationally with these different quantities. Are you going to construct a posterior over it and then use that posterior to answer a question? Are you just going to get rid of these parameters somehow by a more or less elegant integration method or are you just going to set it to some value? So how would we do this in our Gaussian regression model? Well, let's talk about that in a moment and let's consider this uh, gray slide, if you like. If there are more parameters in your model, then you, uh, that, that you currently don't know how to set, then at least the philosophically right way to, to treat them is to just consider them as part of your model and include them in your prior distribution and ideally try to compute a posterior over them. If we want to apply this framework to our Gaussian regression setups that we've been using so far, then uh, we need to check what this evidence term actually is in our Gaussian model. And conveniently, it turns out that this is a term we have essentially already computed. I've just more or less ignored it in previous derivations because it's just a normalization constant of a Gaussian. And um, well, we knew from the lecture, what is that, six, that that normalization constant also takes the form of a Gaussian distribution. So, the, um, the, pro the product of two Gaussian distributions, like up to symmetry and exchanging the parameters here on W, is another Gaussian distribution over W times another expression, a constant, which has the form of a Gaussian PDF. We've usually interpreted this here as prior times likelihood gives posterior, 
if we normalize by hmm, this term. So that's our evidence actually. What is that? So it's the expression you would get if you evaluate a Gaussian PDF at this mean and this covariance. So notice that there's no W in here, of course, because it's the normalization constant of the posterior over W, but there are thetas in here. And this exactly is our likelihood for theta. Interesting, right? So what does this look like? Well, it's another Gaussian distribution, right? And it, that might lead you to immediately think, oh, right, but that means we can just continue with this game, right? We know how to do Gaussian inference. We just put a Gaussian prior, and then we multiply this Gaussian prior with this Gaussian likelihood that we just got here, and uh, oh, hang on. So the parameter theta here doesn't actually enter in a linear fashion. And remember that it's not just enough that everything is Gaussian, it's also that the relationship between variables have to be linear. Here, the relationship between the observation y and the parameter theta that we care about is nonlinear. It depends, well, because the features depend on theta in, well, whichever way we've defined our features. So in the example I've used here, the um, features depend on theta in this very complicated way. So I'm not even sure what that's supposed to be, right? It's a, it's a rational exponential kind of relationship to um, the features. So therefore, we are not going to be able to just put a Gaussian prior here, multiply with it, and just get a Gaussian posterior. And this is a typical problem. I mean, if it were so easy, we would have just included theta into our model in the first place and just got another Gaussian posterior. It's almost sort of by definition that the parameters theta that we can't do Gaussian inference over are the ones that we end up calling the parameters because those are the ones that make the model complicated. So what can we do then? Well, over the course of this lecture, we'll find various different ways of dealing with this situation because it is essentially just another instantiation of the fundamental problem of probabilistic inference that it's just computationally hard. It just requires us to deal with integrals over complicated hypothesis spaces and complicated densities defined on them. So we will add more tools to our toolbox to deal with the situation over the course of the lecture, but um, maybe we should start by adding the most straightforward, most simplistic tool that arguably is almost not probabilistic anymore, which is that we could say, well, okay, let's just not do Bayesian inference on, the, on, on this theta. Let's just use this expression, which is a likelihood, right? It's also, it's a probabilistic quantity. It's a probability distribution for y given theta, all fine and nice. So that's how far we got with our probabilistic reasoning. And now let's just choose whichever theta is the best value for this likelihood. That means whichever theta maximizes this likelihood. We call that computing the maximum likelihood estimate. And because it's not quite the same as maximum likelihood in the classic sense, because classically maximum likelihood would just mean that we choose whichever function f maximizes this likelihood, but we've already integrated out f and computed an evidence and now we're maximizing this likelihood, this marginal likelihood maximization is sometimes called type 2 maximum likelihood or maximizing the marginal likelihood, the model evidence. We're going to add this to our toolbox. So the conceptual, the modeling idea is that we build hierarchical models that take parameters and then put weights on functions derived from these parameters and then the parameters can be treated in a different way than the variables and ideally the variables are the thing you care about and the parameters are the bit that you can get away with just setting somehow and then set them by doing what we will call maximum likelihood. And you might also have to do a minor variation on it, which we will call maximum a posteriori, which I will mention, but it's going to be so simple that I'll just already write it in here because it's a really trivial variation and I will just do a sort of do it on the side later on. So how do we do this hierarchical inference in our Gaussian model explicitly in particular? Well, we've decided to find this, what we might call a point estimate theta hat, which maximizes this marginal, this type two likelihood. Here it is again, this is the other way of writing this, this marginal likelihood, it's literally a marginal, so it's the distribution you get by writing down the joint over the data, the latent function f and the, par the parameter theta we care about, and then getting rid of the unknown function by integrating over it. 
Because this is a Gaussian model, as we saw on the previous slides, this actually has the form, this expression, of a Gaussian probability density function. It's just not a Gaussian distribution, um, well, it's a Gaussian distribution over y, but the mean of it is not a linear map of theta, it's just a nonlinear map of theta. And theta actually shows up not just in the, not just in the mean, but also in the covariance, like, because remember, well, that's just how this works, right? So, if we want to maximize this, we can go through a simple motion that is going to happen several times over this course. And this is maybe the first time we do it. So, um, we'll do it once and then don't worry, we're going to do this several times again because it's actually a really important st like process that makes a connection to statistical machine learning as well. And I'll, like, it's, it's worth pointing that out several times. Here, we're going to do it, we're just going to encounter it for the first time and then in later lectures, we'll talk more about what this connection actually means. So if we decide to construct a point estimate that is the maximum of a likelihood function, even, it, even though it's a marginal likelihood, then, um, which is given by the maximum of this, this marginal probability distribution, then um, because we are maximizing this function, we might as well maximize the logarithm of that function. So why is that allowed? Well, first of all, the logarithm is a monotonic transformation. That means it doesn't shift the location of the maximum. It just changes the value of the maximum value. But we don't care about what that value is. We just care about where it is reached. We are looking for the theta that maximizes this expression. We can take logarithms because, well, I mean, I could say that you know, probability distributions tend to be small, or probability densities tend to be small numbers, less than one, so it might be numerically a good idea to take the logarithm. But actually, there's a more complicated underlying issue, which is that, um, and we'll talk about that later, many probability distributions actually are the exponential of something. The Gaussian, for example, is, right? So, um, actually, let me write down the Gaussian distribution again, because we're going to need this. So, by definition, just to remind you, this probability density function is given by a normalization constant, which is 1 over 2 pi to the number of dimensions, which I call n here divided by 2, times the determinant of sigma to the 1 half, times the exponential of minus 1 half x minus mu transpose sigma inverse x minus mu. So notice that there's already an exponential in here, so it might be a good idea to take the logarithm of this expression because then we'll just get rid of this exponential and it'll be easier to think about. So and it's fine to do that because the logarithm is a monotonic transformation. Now, it doesn't actually matter whether we maximize a function or we minimize minus that function. That's exactly the same thing. Right? You can just roll down the hill or move up the sort of flipped hill, flipped around the, the origin. So you might as well take the minus here as well. That's good because there's a minus in here and that minus then goes away. Okay. So if we do that, then we're left with an expression that's much easier to think about. If we maximize this, large, this marginal likelihood, then what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize a function that is given by this quadratic expression, which is the bit that is in the um, in the exponential. So that, what is this? Well, it's a square distance between the data and the prediction that is made by the prior under the model where if we choose theta, scaled by the variance that is cre created by the model if we choose theta in a particular way. Um, that's the square expression. And then there is another term here, which we'll have to talk about, which arises from this log determinant. So the log determinant um, also uh, well, sorry, the, the covariance matrix also involves theta. I mean, that's just what it has. So that's also something we have to take into account if we want to maximize this expression for theta. And then there is this um, constant, which is n half times log of 2 pi, which isn't that important because it's just a constant shift. And if we are maximizing this expression or minimizing minus the logarithm of that expression, then uh, it doesn't, uh, well, it, it's just, you know, it, it doesn't shift the location of the minimum. So what's happened here is that we now have an expression that you can think of as an empirical risk in the language of statistical learning theory. So here is a, uh, here's, a, here's the data that we care about, that we want to model, and here are the predictions of our model. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize the square distance, log Gaussians are quadratic functions, the square distance between the data 
and the prediction that our model makes. And this is very much an empirical risk, but it's maybe an unusual one because we have this additional factor here. And this factor arises directly from the probabilistic treatment. If we had just said, well, let's just find an expression that um, somehow gives us a model that fits the data well, then maybe an intuitive thing to do would have been to just choose the square error. Maybe just take this particular expression, maybe even not with this complicated structure in sigma, maybe we just would have said, I don't know, like it's just, just, just call that a unit, unit matrix, right, and just maximize um, y minus phi uh, theta um, times, you know, uh, um, a bunch of, of, of uh, weights. And um, actually we'll talk about this later on a little bit in, in, in this lecture in a, in, a, in a few minutes, what that actually means. But um, uh, this is connected to another field that we need to talk about. But we haven't done that. Instead, we've constructed a full probabilistic model that takes into account uncertainty over f. It assigns a probability measure to f that actually has a density, a Gaussian density, and we can reason about it. We could make these little plots and draw animations and samples and think about what that model actually means. And having done so, we realize that if we want to find, like if we want to be at least a little bit true to this probabilistic motivation, even though we are constructing a point estimate now over theta, then there is this term here in this empirical risk that we can't really argue away. It's just part of our reasoning process. And that means maybe we have to think about what this term actually means. This term often shows up in probabilistic hierarchical models of this form. So if you provide, if you, if you construct a model over an unknown function or like, you know, some, some probabilistic model that has variables that you want to infer and then parameters and you do parameter inference in this maximum likelihood type way by marginalizing out the, the probability distribution over the unknown function or the unknown variables then these terms often show up and they have a name. They're called Occam factor. They're named after a um, pan-European but British-born monk. He's maybe the oldest person I ever get to cite in this lecture. Uh, William of Ockham, he was born in um, the small, uh, small hamlet in uh, Surrey in the UK, in Ockham. It, that, that place actually still exists. It's really tiny. It's just a bunch of uh, houses next to each other with a little, a little uh, church. He became a, a, a monk then. That, that church actually still stands. I think the picture in the background you see on this slide actually comes from this particular church. It's a, it's a stained glass window made by Lawrence Lee. Um, and um, of course, nobody really knows what he looks like. So this is just a, an invented drawing. It's too old for to have any kind of uh, semblance of meaningful pictures of what he might have looked like. He um, and traveled across Europe for all sorts of complicated historical reasons. I mean, this is so long ago that you can imagine that it was a complicated time. He died eventually actually in Munich in uh, what was back then Bavaria and um, already. <laughs> and uh, there's, still, there's still a street actually in Munich named after him. He's, he's often cited as the source for a philosophical idea that a, part that a simple explanation should be preferred over a complicated explanation. This is such an abstract notion that, of course, it has been studied in the philosophy of science for, and epistemology for a very long time and comes under all, all sorts of um, complicated names, sometimes also associated with him, like Occam's razor. And it's actually a very complicated notion and it's not particularly well captured by just this one, one expression that I've now written down here as well. Um, he actually also never seems to have written in his whole life this, this quote that is usually attributed to him, which is that entities should not be multiplied, not multiplied without necessity. He did write something kind of similar. He wrote this sentence that I'm uh, just quoting directly from one of his, uh, his texts, which might, have, might be interpreted as plurality, so multiple possible explanations for, uh, uh, for a, an observation should never be positive, should never be created without necessity. We don't have to have complicated multivariate expressions for things that can also be explained in simple ways. Um, by the way, another, another rule that Occam had for uh, his reasoning process was that, it was that it, uh, above all else, you should never criticize the scripture. So maybe he's not the best poster boy for, for uh, rational reasoning, but nevertheless, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice uh, sort of reference point to have, and it's clearly a very, very old idea. So 
what we see a, a form of this in our model here showing up in this expression, which is often interpreted as enforcing the model to be simple, to prefer simple explanations. However, it's a little bit complicated what simple actually means, because this mathematical expression actually describes a function. And if you want to understand what exactly the function does and how it behaves, then um, you have to be, uh, you know, sometimes have to be a bit careful. So here is a picture where I'm trying to give you an intuition for how complicated this expression can be. What I've done here is I've created such a Gaussian model. Here I've now used, again, a different kind of feature set. This is actually by design. I keep using different features because I want you to understand that there is no uniquely correct choice of feature families. You can use these sigmoids, you can use these little bell-shaped functions, you can use rectified linear units, whatever you like, right? There are many, many different features. They might have numerical uh, uh, advantages or disadvantages, but they are a modeling choice. So you have to think about what they mean for your model. Let's say you've decided to use these little Gaussian blobs, these bell-shaped curves. Then if you put a Gaussian prior over these weights and assume that this Gaussian prior is independent, then it produces this prior hypothesis space over function values. So let's say, so the red lines are individual function values and this animation arises in the same way that we've talked about before. Now let's say that we actually have a finite data set given by these um, uh, circles. And they, so they move up and down. These are hypotheses over what these observations at these points might be. I have three different hypotheses which I animate. So each of these are, uh, you know, every single frame of this video is equally likely and there are many, many possible explanations for this data set. Now, what I've done is, so, so this, this model evidently has a bunch of parameters. Let's focus on one of them. One parameter is even if we keep, or keep all these features fixed at their locations, we can make them wider or more narrow. If you make them wider, then this model becomes smoother and the functions that we get to see are going to be much smoother functions. And if you make these um, features smaller or narrower, then we will get more and more spiky functions. So what I'm plotting over here is the value of this Occam factor, of this complexity penalty term, as a function of the width of these features. And you can see that it actually has a non-trivial shape. It's not just something you might have guessed immediately. So what does this actually mean? What I'm currently doing is we're currently at this value here where I have this vertical bar. That's this model you see here. That's close to the maximum penalty. So that's one of the most complicated models you can produce with this um, set of features by varying the, the, these length scales you like, if you like. If we, if we reduce the length scales a lot, then the penalty actually goes down. And why is that? Well, in a, in a sense, if you look at this picture, you might, you might think that this model now actually has become simpler because it's, um, uh, sorry, it has actually become more complex, right? Because it, this picture looks much more busy, right? It's kind of, there's more complicated stuff, uh, spiky, spiky stuff going up and down. But if you look at the data set, then you see that many of these data points are now actually assigned very low flexibility. They're actually almost bounded to zero. And if you make these uh, features ever thinner, then we do end up with a, the zero function, which has the absolute like minus infinity penalty term. So that's a much, much preferred um, um, model, right? Because it can only explain one hypothesis. So that means our hypothesis space is very, very compact. It only, like, it, it, it can only explain one thing, the zero function, and therefore it should maybe be preferred if it can explain data that is actually zero everywhere. Of course, if the data isn't zero, then there will be another penalty from the data modeling term, right, from over here, and then we will not uh, consider that hypothesis anyway. So um, what happens in the other direction? If we move the, towards larger length scales, then we get ever more, actually here's the most extreme case, we get ever more continuous, ever more smooth functions. And asymptotically, if the length scale goes to infinity, we actually get a constant function that in this animation would just move up and down. So it's just a single constant function with an unknown height that is in this hypothesis space. And this again is of course a very simple hypothesis. So if the data allows us to describe, to be described in this simple way, then we should really prefer that, right? Because of course that's an easier way, it's a model with less degrees of freedom, even though it has still the same number of parameters, effectively the hypothesis space spanned by these parameters is much, much simpler and therefore this should be preferred. So when we fit this, this uh, function, here it is again, 
then these two terms, the square error and the Occam factor, trade off complexity against each other so that, well, I, I'm sorry, they trade off complexity against fitting performance. So if you have a, uh, uh, if you are able to describe a data set with small errors, so if the predictions are close to the, what you actually get to see, while using a simple model, then that's better than having an even lower predictive error, but needing a very complicated model to do so. Now, it's tempting to think of this Occam factor as a form of prior, as a form of regularization. But actually, I mean, maybe it is because we have marginalized out a hypothesis space over, over functions. But if you think of it as an empirical risk, then it's really just a different kind of empirical risk. And it's not the same as having a prior on theta. If we wanted to put a prior on theta, then that wouldn't show up in this likelihood, right? It would be an extra term. And if we would add it here to the side, then we would have to multiply this Gaussian with some other function here, which is whatever the prior might be that we put over theta to get a maximum a posteriori estimate. And um, if you take the logarithm of that, then we would have to maximize the sum of the log expression of this and the log prior. If you take the minus of that, we would have to minimize the negative log likelihood minus the log prior. And that would be a new term here that you can basically choose in whichever way we want because we are free to choose our prior over theta. And this would then be called maximum a posteriori estimation. So the Occam factor is not a, a prior over the, it's not the effect, well, it's, it's the effect of a prior, which is the prior over the function, but not a prior over the, um, the, the parameters theta. And therefore, it's really part of the likelihood of the empirical risk, not of the regularization method, essentially. Okay, so we can use this framework to do actual inference on our, on our features. And I've been telling you so much about it now that it's about time that we actually do that as well. So let me show you how this would work. Here are our bunch of features again. We um, have uh, um, on the right-hand side our model. Uh, that, that we've seen before. Let's say we've initialized with five features. These features are just at five different locations. I've put them regularly everywhere. They have a standard smoothness, which is one. And you see that the initial model, which you see in red, is not so great. It's um, maybe quite far away from the data. And now what we can do is we can just maximize the likelihood for this data under the model, which we do by shifting around the features and marginalizing out the latent function, the red cloud of like the red distribution over functions. Doing so involves these two terms, the square error and the Occam factor, the complexity factor. And one thing you might want to know is how much of an effect this complexity penalty of Occam actually has. And one like, advanced warning, in this, at least in this relatively simple example, actually we'll see that the Occam factor has a surprisingly small effect. And we will come back to that when we think about what we want to do with these kind of models. So this is, this is actually a little animation. Let me use this. Let's say we want to maximize this expression. We start with this, uh, sorry, we want to minimize this empirical risk. So we want to maximize the marginal likelihood then um, what we do is we use some kind of optimization method. We'll talk in a second about how that actually works. But let's just say there is a black box optimization method now that does that for us. It takes several steps and in every step it tries to adapt the features so that the, the marginal log likelihood becomes larger or the negative log likelihood uh, uh, drops. And you can see it dropping here and over time actually I can keep it running over time, we'll get a fitted model that has shifted these five parameters around such that they fit particularly well to the data. Now, okay, that's maybe a pleasing picture. Um, maybe it's also a bit of an annoying picture because this plot maybe doesn't look so nice on the right-hand side. Those are takeaways that we should have at this point. So what we've done here is we've fitted a bunch of features in a somewhat probabilistic fashion by marginalizing out the latent quantity called the function, the red cloud of hypotheses, but only computing a point estimate, a fitted estimate for the parameters of the features for these five black functions. Doing so has resulted in a better model than what we had initially, 
It also has maybe some pathologies, like for example, that it goes to zero on the left-hand side, um, or that it's sort of uh, very focused on certain parts of the data. It doesn't know that there might be more data somewhere, somewhere else. You might call this overfitting, and it's not surprising because that's exactly what we told this algorithm to do. We just wanted to minimize this error. And um, that of course can mean that if, because we're not including information like for example, that we might know that there is more data coming on the left-hand side towards, like, to the left of minus five, but the model has never tried to leave any room for explanations in this, in this region. This is a problem with this kind of fitting, even though we are, keeping uh, we are keeping track of uncertainty about the function itself under the data. So here is another gray slide. Parameters, if you saw in the very first, like the first third or so of the lecture, parameters that affect the model should actually ideally in a perfect world be part of the inference process. And for that, we have actually a likelihood in our model already implicitly that's given by the evidence in Bayes' theorem if we do inference on the unknown variables, which in this case is a function. This likelihood is sometimes also called a marginal likelihood or a type two likelihood. Now, typically this kind of inference is not tractable because if it were tractable, we would just make theta part of our variable set and then reason about it jointly with the other parts of the function. So if it's intractable, then we will have to use some approximate way of dealing with this likelihood. And the most, the most approximate of them all, the most radical approach, um, maybe also the most dangerous one, is to just maximize this likelihood, this expression. To do so, we can also minimize the logarithm of that expression, and this gives us a loss function that you can identify with an empirical risk. I'm not saying that every empirical risk model is a, is a log likelihood, um, but every log likelihood gives an empirical risk that we can minimize. And we will talk more about this connection to statistical learning theory in later lectures. This doing so is maybe a non-Bayesian thing to do because we're constructing a point estimate. But it does retain some semblance of Bayesian inference because we are maximizing a marginal likelihood rather than just a direct likelihood. And we can see this in practice. Uh, it has an effect in the sense that it, it, it contributes this Occam factor, this complexity penalty that we would not normally include in an empirical risk if we just had invented it from scratch. Now, in our example, we also saw that this Occam factor actually has a relatively low effect. So make of that what you want. If you prefer the philosophical interpretation, then you're totally right to use this Occam factor, and it's very pleasing in its structure. You also should be aware that it's not always clear that the Occam factor actually helps you um, regularize your, your model or that it matters all that much. If I go back to this slide um, and let this run again, you can see that the, the Occam factor, which is this red curve at the bottom, is actually almost flat and it's very small compared to the, to the square loss. So it has a relatively vague effect and it doesn't prevent the overfitting we see on the right. For that, we would need a prior on theta, which is a different thing and that would be a more probabilistic treatment, which we can still do with this kind of optimization framework because we can just maximize the product of prior and likelihood that would give a maximum a posteriori estimate. And doing so gives rise to a regularization term in this empirical risk. Now in the second part of this lecture, I would like to talk a little bit about how we would implement this optimization process that we just described in detail. And I don't want to do that because I want to give a lecture on optimization um, that can be left to some other lecture course you want to take, but because I want to give you an intuition for how closely related this process, even though we've derived it in this probabilistic way, is to other kinds of machine learning that you already know and have used before, quite probably. And that is, of course, captured in this kind of intuition. So you've, many of you will have already noticed when we did this derivation that um, what we are constructing here, this hierarchical Bayesian model in which we are taking an input and then constructing features from that input, by using a bunch of parameters that define the features and then mapping these features through a weight to construct an output that this sort of, at least if we write it as a graph like this, is reminiscent of the process called deep learning. 
I mean, now here we just have two layers. You can think of this as a neural network if you want to use this nomenclature. Here's the input, which is a vector, so it's a multivariate input. Here's the output, which is maybe a real number, maybe it's a multivariate output as well. And what we've assumed is that the output is linearly related to the weights through the features, but non-linearly related to, uh, to the input because the input enters the features and the features are non-linear functions of the input. That also means that this entire resulting function from x to y is a non-linear function on the parameters theta. So, of course, we could make this deeper and then we would have a deep neural network. We could add more features, layers of features and their uh, parameters. And clearly, we've constructed here something that is quite close to a neural network. So, in particular, it's close to a neural network for regression purposes, where the output loss from here uh, on, on this final layer is a quadratic function because we are thinking of maximizing uh, minimizing the negative log Gaussian likelihood. So the log Gaussian likelihood is a quadratic function. Now we haven't actually done that because we have marginalized out this final layer W. At the very end of this lecture we'll see what happens if you don't do that because then we get really close to deep learning. But, I, but of course there is a very clear or let's call it a deep connection to deep learning here and in particular, there is an algorithmic connection to it, which we, like, what, what, what we're doing here is we're minimizing an empirical risk, essentially. It's an empirical risk we constructed by getting rid of the final layer, by marginalizing out over it, because we can do it, so we might as well do it, because we want to be Bayesian or probabilistic. But what we're doing with respect to theta is really just empirical risk minimization of a non-trivial empirical risk, which we've derived in a probabilistic fashion. So what I want to do is to show that the notions that, that the algorithmic notions that make deep learning powerful also apply to this framework. Because people have, I think, especially in the younger generations have gotten this impression that there are different parts of machine learning, they're called deep learning and probabilistic and statistical learning and they are somehow separate from each other and they don't overlap at all. I want to show that these notions are actually quite close to each other and that they often overlap in, in um, what they are leading to. There are also people already in the community who have started to talk about something that you might not call deep learning, but instead differentiable programming. Jan Le Kuhn, for example, does that now. And I want to show you that this, what we're doing here, can very much be a differentiable program. And um, so if you want to think in terms of differentiability and automatic differentiation, then that applies here as well. If you don't know about automatic differentiation, and I think some of you might not know, then you can use the next few minutes to learn about this fundamental, beautiful idea of automatic differentiation. So if we want to optimize this loss function, which we just constructed on previous slides, which is the negative log marginal likelihood of our Gaussian model, and we want to optimize it with respect to theta, then we need to compute this function, L of theta, and we need to find its minimum. So let's first think about what we need to do to compute the value of this function L at a particular point in theta. So if we choose a particular theta, what is the loss function? Well, to do so, you could think of a computational graph that looks like this. So I've given names to the intermediate quantities, and this is one particular way you could use to define this function in code. Of course, you're free to choose what your intermediate steps are, what your functions are, Let's say I've decided to implement this code in the following way. I first take theta and then I evaluate the features. So that's what, it's actually what, what we did in the previous lecture in Python. We define a function that computes the features. And that of course depends on theta, right? So that gives us phi of theta. Then I'm going to compute the quantities I'm going to need to compute L. So first of all, I need the inner product between phi and sigma and phi. Let's call that K. There's a reason why we call it K. You'll find out in the next lecture. Uh, okay, here it is. And um, then I need to add lambda. Lambda is something I'm not going to optimize. It's just something we have in memory somewhere. It's just, a, let's say, a variable that's available. And then um, add this together. This gives me a matrix G. That matrix I have to invert. Actually, let's call the inverse of that matrix. So this, whole, this plus this inverted, let's call that G. I need to compute that. And then, okay, so I um, also am going to need the log determinant of this, but I could also do this by just computing k, adding lambda, 
and then computing the log determinant directly. Let's call that a function c that takes as its input k and uh, uh, knows lambda. And then um, we also need to compute these vectors, these, these residuals. Let's call them delta because they are residual between the data and the prediction under the mean. For that we need phi, obviously, uh, but also y and, and mu. But y and mu don't depend on, on theta. So let's just say that they are around, they are stored somewhere. That gives us delta. And now we just fit everything together. So we can compute the quadratic error term, which is one part of our optimization problem. Um, that's, uh, let's call that E because it's an error. And that's the inner product between delta and G and delta. Or delta transpose G and delta. Okay, so for that we need delta and G and that gives us E. And um, we need this Occam's, Occam's complexity factor. So let's call that C, which is just a log determinant of K plus lambda. And we can sum these two together and that gives us L. So when we compute this, we're essentially following through this directed acyclic graph. Notice that this is actually a directed acyclic graph. It's not a graphical model. That's why I'm using these uh, square, rotated square type uh, nodes rather than circles to um, not confuse you and make you think about probabilistic graphical models. But it's really just a very similar notion. It's a graph that is directed and acyclic. And what we're doing here is we're essentially passing messages, if you like this um, metaphor, between variables in this graph to compute individual values. Okay, so that's how you would compute your loss function. Now, if you want to optimize this loss function, it's not enough to just compute the loss function. You want to know where its minimum is. So if you're starting at some point theta, you need to know in which direction to step to decrease that function. And an important quantity to be able to do that is the gradient, so the derivative of this function L with respect to theta. Now, it turns out, and again, many of you will have seen this before, if you haven't, then follow along, and we'll actually talk, look at what this looks like in code in the flipped classroom. If you know about uh, automatic differentiation already, then maybe this is a, a, a particular interpretation that you haven't seen yet, or you can also just skip forward if you're bored by this process. That's the beauty of a video recording. You can just skip forward if you think you know something. So it turns out that computing a gradient of such a function that is implemented in this kind of form is surprise, can be done surprisingly efficiently, at least if you think about it for the first time, it might be surprising. And it can be done, so, can be done in a more or less mechanic way that only requires to, you to implement local operations when writing your code rather than computing like writing a separate function for the gradient. So about 15 years or so ago what people used to do to compute gradients is they would implement this function L and then they would sit down with a piece of paper and write down what the gradient is. So they would go through and compute gradients of all the individual terms using the chain rule. We'll do that in a moment. And, and then sit down again and write a second function called gradient of L that uh, it also computes the gradient. And then those two together would be used for the optimizer. So the optimizer, actually optimization algorithms typically ask for separately the function value and the gradient. So you feed both of these functions to them and then they run. This is very tedious because it requires additional mental load and work on a piece of paper and also implementation work. Often these gradients are then faulty because they have bugs and uh, these bugs are then difficult to track down because there's this complicated function. And all of this changed over the past few years through the development of automated differentiation software packages. And actually, you might argue even that the, 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 the deep learning revolution, this extreme renaissance of uh, deep learning techniques, is to a large degree due to this software structure because it allows uh, writing reusable code and efficient code that can also be parallelized efficiently. So how does this beautiful process work of automatic differentiation? So we'll do this by just looking at what we have to compute here and then think about what we're doing. We're not going to do abstract theory of automatic differentiation because this is not the course for it. So how does this work? Let's say we, wanted to, we want to compute the gradient of this loss function L with respect to the quantity we want to optimize, theta. So there's two different ways of doing this. And they are called, actually there's multiple different ways of doing it, but there's two particularly prominent ways of doing it, which are called forward and backward mode of automatic differentiation. We'll do forward mode first. Actually, it turns out that this particular setting is not good for forward mode. It actually prefers backward mode. 
like most of machine learning, but it's easier to think about for forward mode first. Um, so just follow along. What do we need to do to compute this gradient? Well, we could look at this graph and then we could do, we could mentally go backward through the graph to think about what quantities we need to compute the gradient and expand them using the chain rule. And then we'll find that, and I'll show you in a second, once we've done this mental backward pass through the graph, we actually have all the quantities we can then implement in an algorithm that as it moves forward through the graph and computes these individual quantities from theta to L, can actually just drag along necessary quantities to comp compute all of the gradients. This is called forward mode because of this final step. So how does this work? Okay, let's look at L. L is a function of E and C. So we can write the LD theta using the chain rule as the LDE times the ED theta plus the LDC dCD theta. So at the point in time when we are computing L, we know what E and C is. So we know what the LDE is and the LDC because we can compute the gradient of L with respect to E and actually I've written it down somewhere already on the, on the next slide. I'll only flip back and forth once and then you can do that, do that later. So what's the LDE? Well, look at this expression up here. It's just one half, right? Because L is one half times E plus one half times C. And the LDC is also just one half. So if we, uh, we don't even need to know what E and C is. It's just a constant. It's just one half. Okay, fine. So, but it, things get a little bit more complicated. But notice that we have this DLDC, which we know now, and the LDE. And we just need to know the ED theta and the CD theta, which are downward objects here. So we can write the LD theta as some object, let's call it M9 dot. So that's a message number nine, and it's the dot message. This is a message for forward mode differentiation. And M8 dot times uh, the CD theta and the ED theta. Okay, now we recursively repeat this process. What's the, what's, uh, what's the ED theta? Well, E is a function of delta and G, and C is a function of K. So we can expand. We can write the ED theta as the ED delta times the delta D theta plus the EDG DG D delta, uh, DG D theta, plus wh what, what about the C D theta? Well, C only depends on K, so there's a D, D C D K times D K D theta. So at the point in time when we're computing these quantities, we know what delta is. So therefore we can compute the E d delta because what is the E d delta? Well, the E d delta is, let's look at this expression. This is E and this is delta here, each of these terms. So the E d delta, this is a quadratic function. Okay, so now we need to do some multivariate calculus, right? So you just need to know how to compute these gradients. There's actually, you know, uh, rule box, rule books, cheat, cheat sheets that you can use online. Um, if you've taken an undergraduate multivariate calculus class, then you should know how to compute these quantities. And if you've taken the math for ML class here in Tübingen by Matthias Hein, of course you know how to compute these quantities. So the E d delta is because it's a quadratic function. It's just two times G times delta. And this is actually a vector. So for that, we need to know G and delta but they are available at the point in time when we're computing E, right? Because E depends on delta and G as well. So of course we have them available. Good. So now and you've probably gotten a hang of how this works. Now we just keep doing, just expanding all these remaining black terms, whenever they show up, we just expand them going down through the graph. And eventually we're left with an expression that only contains all these quantities we can compute. And then a final expression that's d phi d theta times d theta d theta. d theta d theta is just one. And the phi d theta is, well, it's whatever your derivative of your feature is with respect to its uh, parameters. So that depends on how you've chosen your features. So for our uh, sigmoidal features, that has a particular value. And for Gaussian features, it has a different value and so on. OK, so now this is just a structure. This is just a piece of code, essentially, that, that we can automatically, no, not automatically, but which we can write when we implement E or G or delta or all the other variables in the graph. So when you're implementing E, you need to implement that um, uh, E is, is a function of delta and G and it's delta times G times delta or delta transpose times G times delta. And then you can also implement what the derivative of E is with respect to delta because it is, here we go, um, two times G times delta. So you just write that line as well and you can call that forward. Okay, and uh, you can also implement the EDG because it's just delta times delta and you have delta available. So all of this can be written in your program code for E.
Now, at the time, point in time when we actually evaluate L, we can now do a forward pass. So to compute L, we compute, we sum, we, we compute all the M's, right? The M's are just um, objects that make inputs into, into the subsequent functions. But we can also compute the messages with a dot on top. We just use the corresponding code in the implementation and then just, you know, um, do compute this essentially, right? So this is a pass forward just like we're computing L to get the gradient. Now notice that sort of intuitively, it's not, I haven't really shown this rigorously, but intuitively it becomes clear that doing so is not going to be necess it's, it's not going to be more complex in general than to compute L itself because it's the same path through the graph. Now some of the individual terms in here may of course be a little bit more complicated, but it turns out that there's actually a bound on how much more complex they can be. Now, um, there is a problem though, which is that some of the quantities that show up in here are potentially very large vectors. So for example, we need here to compute down here the phi d theta. So phi is actually, I have this somewhere here. So this object, d phi d theta, is actually a complicated multivariate tensor. So it's not just a, even a matrix, it's a three-dimensional object because we have um, the feature functions, right? They map from the inputs to the outputs. So there are F features and there might be several inputs. So there are two indices to this feature function, A and B. And then they depend on multiple parameters. So that they, uh, this object also needs to keep track of all of that. So now we have indices A, B, and L, three different indices. And this object we have to keep track of is a three-dimensional array, which of course can be computationally burdensome. So it turns out that there is another, um, well, and maybe just to finish that thought, eventually we're just going to compute the L d theta. So L is a scalar object and theta is just of whatever size theta is, right? So we might be lucky that there might be some cool trick to abbreviate this computation such that um, we actually have, don't have to keep track of these complicated multidimensional arrays, right? Now it turns out that there is such a trick and it's called backward mode automatic differentiation and it's a good choice to make if the output is a low dimensional function like this scalar function here. So how does backward mode mode? Uh, how does backward mode work? So backward mode is ever, ever so slightly more complicated to think about, but it actually is a variant of what we just did. So instead of starting at the top and then expanding the immediate terms E and C, we instead expand the other way around. So the LD theta is, let's look at the bottom of the graph, the LD phi times the phi d, d theta. Okay, so we've had this term before. So this is the defined theta we just spoke about, but now we're going to introduce new variables in the other way around. We'll just call this entire expression, we'll call that m1 bar. And these expressions, they, they, are, um, they are going to end up in, at this point in the graph, but it's a little bit more tricky to think about them because they're actually defined as the whole thing, right? as the product of these two expressions. It's not just an individual term in here gets a name, it's the whole thing. And these are called adjoint adjoints. Okay, so, but now we're actually going to continuously, recursively con do the same thing as before. It's just that we pass through the graph the other way around. So now mentally we, we pass from the bottom to the top. So that's kind of a forward thought process, which will then give us an algorithm that actually works in the backward way. So um, what is the LD phi? Well, so phi feeds into delta and k. So let's expand and write um, the LD phi as the LD delta times the delta D phi plus the LDK, DK D phi. And the bit behind here, relief. So we already know what the whole thing is. We've given a name to that. We've, we've, we've called it M1 bar. And now we'll give a, give a name to the individual summons in this um, chain rule expansion. Okay, and let's call them M2 and M3. And this is a good idea because these will now be um, localized in the graph at a particular point, right? Because we know that there's going to be a delta involved here and nothing else because that's exactly how we've expanded the term. Now let's keep going. So what's, uh, what's up with delta? So delta feeds into E. Um, so we're going to look at E next. So um, where is that? So here we're going to get a DLDE and then um, a DE D delta, D delta D phi. Okay, that's going to be our 
um, M6 times the thing we already have, which is uh, which we've locally computed, which is the LD5. Now, notice that the LD5 is the thing that we can compute locally, just as the KD5 or the phi d theta in previous examples, and the other bits are the bits that we have to keep going to compute. Now, if we expand that all the way to the top, then eventually we're just going to need a DLDE times the remaining bit. So where is that? It's over here. Uh, no, it's uh, it's the well. Okay. Well, eventually we are going to need a DLDE times the ED theta and a DLDC times the CD theta. And for these, we actually know what the corresponding objects are. So, we're, so as we expand from forward upwards, for example, here we get um, that M7, as we move back for, further up here, we get a DL, DLDC times um, DC DK, and this DLDC we'll call M8 bar, and we know what that is, it's just one half, right? Because the LDC is just one half. Okay, and uh, now, we, if we, let's say we now uh, have computed L, so we, we, we've done our forward pass to compute L, uh, just the function itself, and we now want to use, want to compute the gradient of L with respect to theta, then we can use these quantities with the bar that we just derived also to compute the gradient. So how is that going to work? Well, so we could, we could start at the top, that's why it's a backward pass, and look at, see that there are two incoming messages, M8 and M9, and we just need to show where they show up in this tableau over here. So M8 and M9, which are one half, actually show up in, ah, M8 only shows up in M7, okay, so for that uh, we will need M8 times DC DK, okay, and um, so DC DK is something we know at this point, which we could have implemented in our code for, oops, sorry, for C, and then uh, we need to check, so um, this, where this M8 is part of, that's M8 is, is part of, of an M7, okay? And for M7, we need to now check where M8, M7 shows up again. And you notice that there's a process I'm doing here, which is that I'm looking at the tableau and checking back which variables show up at which point as we go back down the graph. And for this, we need an additional data structure, which we didn't need for forward pass, which is called a uh, Wengert list. So there's an additional kind of cost to, to store this kind of object, but that cost is low because it amounts to just storing that graph and a, a lookup table in this graph for which variables fit into other, uh, feed into other variables. What do we get in exchange for that? Well, an advantage is that because we've kept expanding the terms at the front of the chain rule, which are dl, d, some other quantity, these are always in some sense small quantities because they are always an object of the form dl, d something. And because L is a scalar, we don't get these necessarily really big arrays. So therefore, this kind of process, which maps from a low dimensional object onto, um, well, for, for this kind of process we just derived, this backward mode differentiation, can be computationally more efficient for settings in which the uh, output variable is low dimensional and the intermediate quantities can be more high dimensional. And this is often the case in machine learning because we, are, we tend to predict simple objects like class labels or response variables as functions of complicated inputs, data like images or speech recordings and so on. In machine learning, historically, this algorithm was known as backpropagation, or actually still known as backpropagation, but it's a specific case of this automatic differentiation framework, which by various accounts goes back to the Finnish scientist Seppolina Ma, uh, who did this, I think actually in his master thesis, but don't quote me on this, in uh, 1970. All right. So why did we do all of this? Well, first of all, for those of you who haven't seen uh, automatic differentiation yet, now you know, um, and the more you know. But secondly, it's important to understand that this is a process which is often associated with deep learning, but we're not doing deep learning here. We're doing hierarchical Bayesian inference. So the fact that gradients can be computed automatically is not the, a, a, a unique identifier of deep learning. And in fact, if you, like, if you like deep learning because you can do autodiff, then maybe you don't like deep learning. Maybe you really just like autodiff. 
and maybe you want to do probabilistic inference as well or hierarchical Bayesian inference and use these kind of toolboxes and frameworks of which there are now more and more and more and more powerful ones to do, to build fast, reproducible, reliable machine learning algorithms. Now of course, and I can't end without making the connection to the more core idea of deep learning, you are used to seeing pictures like this where you don't just have a single layer of features and an input, but instead a hierarchy of features, a deep neural network that maps from an input through several layers of nonlinear transformations and linear transformations. So at each layer, we take whatever comes in, we multiply with a bunch of linear features, uh, linear weights, sorry, to compute features and then take a nonlinear function of that linear transformation and then keep doing that. So now we can compute a linear transformation of the, this nonlinear function and feed it into a new nonlinear function and so on. Um, you can also just maximize an empirical risk function, whatever it is, to make these weights from W0 to W3 such that the, um, the, some form of error, some empirical risk between Y and F of X is minimized. And typically that empirical risk for regression problems, so for problems where the output is real valued, is something like a quadratic error. So um, if you do that, and this is for just this slide, completely unrelated maybe to what we've done so far, then you're used to being able to do something. So here's our data set again, uh, to being able to do something like what I'm gonna show you in a moment, which is to take this function, which depends, so f of x, which depends on w0, w1, w2, w3, and some fixed choices of these nonlinearities, like the features that we've used here today, and then just minimize the, this empirical risk function using an algorithm that uses this gradient we just computed, that we compute, can, be, can compute in this backprop kind of way. So um, in particular to compute gradients and then maybe just follow the gradient using gradient descent. I actually have an animation for this here so we can do that. If we do this, then we, this algorithm, if you're lucky, I mean, there's no, not really a guarantee it will because this is not necessarily a convex optimization problem, but if you're lucky, it might find an explanation like this. Here, I've used three different layers and in each layer, I've used uh, bell-shaped features, Gaussian features. Again, because I don't want you to get the impression that there's only one family of features anyone could ever use. And if you do that, so you see, actually, if you, if you have the slides, you can use the animation as well to run it again and again. You see that the algorithm has, uh, here are the features. So in the very first layer, you still see the Gaussian shape. But then, of course, in subsequent layers, because they are Gaussians of Gaussians, the features become more complicated. You see that what we are learning is this kind of function. Here, I'm actually only using these six features. So um, two on each layer. That's enough for this very simple kind of model. And we're learning this kind of function. Okay, so this is maybe deep learning. I mean, admittedly, it's a one-dimensional example with just six features and three layers. And maybe that's not deep and wide enough for you, but it is essentially deep learning. So maybe the question you've had while we're waiting for, while we've been going through this, through this lecture is what is the connection between what we've been doing here and deep learning precisely? And I want to end this lecture on pointing that out. So, so far, I've made the argument that we should do this, that we should integrate out all the quantities we know how to integrate out, so integrate out w here, up here, because we know how to do it. But notice that the main reason I did so was that because I wanted to be Bayesian and probabilistic and I just knew how to do this. So maybe I'm unlucky and the likelihood function here just isn't Gaussian, then I in general won't know how to integrate out w. And then I might just do maximum likelihood inference on the whole thing. There might also be another reason to do that, which is that once we have a complicated hierarchical model like this one, then um, maybe it seems a bit silly to say, oh, I'm going to treat this final output layer W3 in a special way. I'm going to integrate out these W3s because they are so important. But really, they're just two numbers right, that map from here to Y. And all the other ones, W0, W1, W2, I've left out and treated somehow differently and used point estimates for them just because I didn't know how to. So if that's your thought process, then you might decide to just treat the final layer like all the previous ones as well. And then you actually end up with deep learning. So let's see how this works. If we're doing Bayesian inference on um, the weights of this neural network, let's now treat W and theta as basically the same thing. 
then we are, we are trying to compute a posterior. This posterior is proportional up to normalization to a prior times a likelihood. Now, um, so here uh, one assumption we might make is that the individual observations are independent of each other, conditioned on the model. So that means that our observation noise has come somehow local and independent. And we can maybe make the assumption if you're doing a regression task, so if y is a real number, that the noise is actually Gaussian. Maybe that's an intuitive thing to do. Then the, um, uh, that's our prior times likelihood. The likelihood now becomes like, come, factorizes into, into, into individual terms of conditionally independent random variables y, i, given the model parameters. Then um, uh, now, in general, we would like to compute this posterior. So we would need to normalize by the normalization constant and find some kind of expression for what this posterior is that doesn't just require us to evaluate all of this because otherwise you would have to keep around the data set all the time. Now, um, that might be hard in general because of this complicated hierarchical structure of the features. Now, um, what we might decide to do, as we have in earlier parts of this lecture, is to not actually compute the entire posterior but only find a best guess that is inspired by this probabilistic model, which is to maximize this expression, this posterior distribution. If you want to maximize that expression, we might as well minimize the negative logarithm of that expression. So just to do that thought process once again, we can take the logarithm because logarithms are monotonic transformations and they don't shift the location of the maximum. We can take the minus and the minimum of the minus because it's the exact same thing, right? The location of the minimum of minus some expression is equal to the location of the maximum of that expression. Fine. So now let's look at what these expressions actually are. Well, so for the, we're going to get, because we take the log, this product turns into a sum. We get initially negative logarithm of the prior, whatever that might be. And then we get, because these are independent Gaussians, we get a sum, because the product turns into a sum, of minus logarithms of Gaussians. And the logarithm of a Gaussian, in particular a scalar Gaussian for an individual label y, is just a square. Because Gaussians are e to the minus square. Okay, so what we have here now is an empirical risk minimization problem where we're trying to minimize a function that is, happens to be the square loss between um, the data and the, the prediction that the model would make if we pass forward from the input to the output through W. And the square loss shows up because we're using a Gaussian assumption. And this is something we will talk about again in subsequent lectures in your head. When, if you are coming from a statistical learning background, whenever you see a square somewhere that is being minimized, you should think of a Gaussian assumption in the corresponding likelihood or prior function. What about the prior? So this negative um, log prior is often instead called R and called a regularizer. Now again, fair warning, not every empirical risk is a log likelihood and not every regularizer is a log prior. But every log prior is a regularizer and every log likelihood is an empirical risk if you want to call them that because they're just functions that you can minimize um, or you can minimize their negative logarithm. So let's say, just for sake of argument, because it might make a fun connection, that we've decided to use a prior that happens to be Gaussian as well for W and, and theta. What would that amount to? Well, it would amount to setting this negative log loss to a quadratic function. And if we take a totally um, centered, so zero mean unit covariance matrix uh, uh, Gaussian, then we're just summing up the squares of, oh, there's a square missing here, the squares of W and theta. And what we have here is an empirical risk minimization problem which, with an empirical risk that is quadratic and a regularizer that's also quadratic. So we are solving in essentially a, well, we shouldn't call this a least squares problem because there is, well, I mean, you, you might call that a, a general least squares problem because there is a, the, a relationship on theta here that isn't linear. So we can't solve this in closed form, but we're still minimizing a quadratic function. And that exactly is what you do if you're training a deep neural network with individual nonlinearities given by the features phi on a, on a regression task 
which is why you use the quadratic loss on the, on the output, and you use these regularizers, which are known as weight costs, as quadratic weight costs. So that's, if you like, a concrete connection between what we've been doing in our Gaussian inference framework and deep learning. By the way, of course, what people then often usually do is that they subsample the data set to get mini batches. It's not like you couldn't do this here as well, right? Of course, it's the exact sort of same setup. Okay, so that we're at, we're at the end. What we've done today is to see that um, when there are, there are parameters in our model that we don't know how to set, then ideally the philosophically clean way to deal with them would be to do Bayesian inference over them, which requires us to assign a prior to them. That's fine, that's not a hard problem. We can come up with priors. But the more complicated problem is that we need to compute a posterior by multiplying this prior with a likelihood and normalizing. And that multiplication usually leads to intractable problems. Because if they were tractable, we would just make these parameters into variables of our model. When we do so, then um, at least in the regression case, we've actually created an instance of something that is quite comparable or maybe even identical to a neural network. And when we train this neural network, we are essentially fitting the hyperparameters or parameters of our probabilistic model by maximizing the, well, in the standard deep learning setting, by just maximizing the likelihood of, the, of, of our probabilistic model directly. Or if we are trying to be a little bit smarter, we can sometimes integrate out the final layer to get a maximum marginal or type 2 maximum likelihood estimate for our model. This yields a connection to the, between the Bayesian framework we've been talking about and deep learning, which is um, obviously a In the next lecture, we're going to address a second idea, which in some sense is orthogonal to what we've done today. Instead of keeping a fixed number of features and tuning them, we're going to think about how we can create models, how we can, exp how we, how we can create expressive models by instead increasing the number of features towards an infinite limit in such a way that we actually end up with a tractable model again. Until then, thank you very much for your attention.